right on right on cue and a nice segue given Sarah Jane's been asking the questions. Our next speaker is uh, Sarah Jane Cooper Knock, who's a lecturer in international developments um, at the University of Edinburgh, and she's going to be speaking to us about her recent empirical research on a summons to the magistrates' courts. So, Sarah Jane, over to you. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I once had to listen to my voice already, and it's now just about to be subjected to it again. Um, so I'll try and keep this presentation brief so that uh, we can just keep the floor open for, for discussion. And um, my, my friend Prof Samchi always says that uh, PowerPoint, uh, power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. So I've not done any slides for this. I'm just going to be chatting to you and I'm really happy to take your questions afterwards. So this is basically a piece of research that I have been uh, doing with a colleague, Anna McDonald, who is based at the LSE and University of East Anglia. And it is looking at uh, magistrates courts in uh, Uganda and South Africa, specifically within uh, the municipality of Etiquene in South Africa and within Gulu in Uganda. And so it starts from the premise that magistrates courts are a really vital part of the state justice system in South Africa and Uganda, but there's there's a real vast academic literature on justice in both countries, but there's relatively little attention paid to uh, magistrates courts themselves. I say relatively little attention, there's never a, a complete lack and there's some really valuable studies, but we, this is more a point of kind of when we were looking at the literature on different justice institutions, uh, there was relatively little focus on magistrates courts. Instead, there's um, a really rich literature in both countries around the higher courts in the justice system, uh, and a great deal has been written as well on why people don't engage with state courts. Um, so that has, for example, um, raised the problems of inadequate infrastructure or staff shortages, case backlogs, perceptions of corruption, and ideas of justice and accountability that diverge potentially from those of the state. And all of this literature is really valuable, those insights are really fantastic. But we are left with a little less idea of why people do engage with lower state courts and with what consequences. And in practice, large numbers of citizens are engaging in magistrates courts every year. And so our research was basically designed to try and gain a better understanding of why people take their disputes to magistrates courts and what experiences they have while they're there. And in doing so, uh, I guess theoretically, we ended up wrangling with the, the prevalence of procedural justice, which is quite prevalent in the access to justice literature around, um, around courts, both in South Africa and Uganda, and actually kind of more broadly as well. And the procedural justice approach, I'm going to do this incredibly briefly, so uh, I'm sorry if I do any kind of violence to the idea, but this is an approach that argues that if basically court procedures are seen to be rule bound and respectful and neutral, then courts will be seen to be legitimate. And to the extent that courts are seen this way, they'll be used by citizens and their judgments will be treated as binding. Now, what we're not doing with our research is discounting the importance of transparent, respectful, predictable procedure. But we do argue that if people are looking to understand how, how people engage in magistrates' courts and why they do so, then the procedural justice model falls short. And the kind of empirical basis that we're using to draw on this is um, several months each of uh, with, a, with a team of research assistants of observing uh, different magistrates' courts and also uh, a series of interviews with people who had different criminal and civil cases within uh, magistrates' courts as well. And we argue that while the procedural justice model gives us a really neat model of citizen court interactions, the reali reality is really far more complex because disputes are a really messy business. And we see this in the literature uh, both within South Africa more broadly. So uh, Cindy Somnisi Weeks' brilliant work on the life of a dispute. We see it in Anne Griffiths' work um, and we see it um, in different contexts. For example, Sally Angle Mary's work in the US as well. All of this work tells us that disputes are incredibly messy. And so consequently, lower level courts often deal with disputes that are more diffuse than the legal matter in question. And the types of justice that people seek may also go beyond the parameters of what a court can offer. And so that's where we have a real difficulty with the neatness of the procedural justice model, um, because actually it doesn't capture the complexity of the disputes brought to a court, what people are hoping for, what people are expecting, what they're actually getting. 
And the difficulty with that is that if the theories that we're using to understand citizen court interactions aren't capable of dealing with a complex picture, then the solutions they suggest will be appealing, but they'll ultimately be ineffective. And our research suggests that people engaging with courts um, are basically seeking to reconcile three factors. And this, this is an idea that um, was developed from some work I did in, in policing across Etiquini as well. The first is how people think the courts should act. The second is how they need them to act. And the third is how they expect them to act in any given instance. And we argue that the weight that each factor carries varies, but that we need to take each into account if we want to sharpen our understanding of citizen court engagement and develop policies to improve court outcomes. So what I'll do is just briefly take each of those in turn. Let's start with how people think that the court should act. And that's kind of talking very much about people's ideas about how the court should operate. And that we're arguing that that can play an important role in shaping people's motivations for engaging with the legal system. And this is basically drawing on a broader literature that argues that state imaginaries so or ideas about what the state should be um, can play a really important role in shaping how we respond to state institutions and to citizens and others, um, even if those ideas of what should be don't necessarily bear an, a resemblance to what does actually happen in real life. So state imaginaries are really important, um, but they vary greatly. Uh, across different uh, citizenships, uh, citizens. And we saw this playing out in uh, different ways within our sample. So it's not when we're saying that kind of people's idea of what should happen at court is important and sometimes drives them to take a case to the magistrate's court. We're not saying in any simple sense that what the, the idea of what should happen is an idea that ties neatly to a kind of uh, a particular model of a liberal state, for example. People's ideas about what should happen can really vary, but this idea of the kind of the normative uh, can play a really important part in shaping people's um, move to take a court, uh, a case to the magistrate's court. The second is how people expect the courts to act. Now, through this kind of factor, we're saying that the experiences that groups and individuals amass over time can play a critical role in shaping their predictions for the future. Now, these expectations may shape whether people approach the courts, they may shape how they behave when they engage with the courts, and they may shape how they interpret events that occur in the courtroom. And those predictions remain important, even if the predictions are based on unproven assumptions. For example, the belief that courts are corrupt can shape people's understandings of their own case, even if no corruption is actually practiced. And thirdly, how people need the courts to act. So in their pursuit of dispute resolution and justice, people may use the police and the courts tactically and pragmatically to reach the ends that they need. For example, people might open a case in order to gain leverage in an ongoing criminal or civil case elsewhere or another dispute outside of court. Alternatively, they may take someone to court because the process of attending court is a form of punishment in itself, even if the case in question is eventually dropped. So when courts measure their success in criminal cases, they often do so in the numbers of cases that reach a conviction. But when we're talking about how people need the courts to act, we're opening up the possibility that actually people aren't always seeking um, a conviction. There may be many things that people need a court to do beyond convicting someone. And that needs to play an important part in us understanding why courts are used and the terms on which they're used. So we're left with these three factors, what people think should happen, what people expect to happen, and what they need to happen in any given instance. And these can vary in the importance that they play in people's decision making, and they can play a varied kind of role in how people will reflect on and, uh, uh, and recount their experiences with their own individual case, and the way they extrapolate from that to broader justifications and ideas and conclusions about the criminal justice justice system. So what does all of that mean for uh, how we think about access to justice? Let's bring it back to the bigger picture. Well, in um, an article we've just written that kind of draws these uh, findings together, we're saying that actually there is an important reason why we need to keep all of these three things in mind, because they, they kind of um, 
resist any easy conclusions, any neat models about citizen court interactions. And they help us to explain and capture the full set of reasons why people might engage with uh, lower state courts and how they might view those engagements. And we need to understand in, our kind of, in any kind of policy making that happens uh, at a local, national, international level, that how people reconcile their ideals and ideals, needs and expectations isn't anything that you can simplify in any clear way. And so in a sense, we're, we're consciously opening up and holding the space for complexity. And we're saying that, at, that when you are pursuing a very simple citizen court engagement model, you are losing uh, not just the explanatory per, uh, purchase that your theoretical approach might have, but you're losing any kind of uh, capacity that policies developed from that can have a, a predictable and efficacious outcome. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're left with the inability to make any kind of policy prescriptions, and far from it. And there were some ways in which we thought that uh, there could be policy outcomes developed from this kind of uh, evidence. And we do so really tentatively, uh, aware of both uh, the, the small scale of the research that we've conducted and our own positionality. Uh, but one example um, that we could take is in South Africa. Um, in South Africa, there are established outreach programs from magistrates' courts into local communities, um, which are basically explaining the basics of how a court works. Um, and we think that our research can potentially problematize the enthusiasm that courts have uh, in going out into communities to explain the basics of how a court works. Not to say that legal education is never important, of course it is and it has its place, but a lot of these kind of outreach programs are based on the assumption that when people are engaging with the courts in ways that court officials think is a misuse of the court, then court officials and policymakers have a tendency to think that that is because people are not aware of how the court should function. Um, and what we're suggesting through our research is that actually that might overestimate the degree to which a gap between how court officials think the court should be functioning and what people, how people are trying to use the courts, there might be an overestimation in the degree to which that is due to ignorance or misinterpretation. And actually what we might be seeing is people trying to purposefully repurpose a court process um, in order to um, make the courts work better for them. So this can mean that outreach events prove ineffective, uh, telling communities what they already know and failing to substantially shift their engagements in courts because they, it misunderstands why people are trying to uh, purpose and repurpose their engagement with the courts in different ways. So rather than focusing on community outreach, we argue that courts should push more resources into funding officials within the court who can help people navigate the institution, both literally and metaphorically. We have to be careful with these blanket prescriptions, though, um, and uh, and I think that there's a, a real need to hold, keep holding that space open for complexity. Uh, but I think what that is a useful demonstration of is the fact that complexity doesn't collapse the space for possible policy prescriptions, but it helps us to think about how policy outcomes can be forged in different ways. For trying to better understand people's motivations and experiences enables us to more accurately identify where guidance is helpful and what form it might usefully take. Um, and so all too often we're arguing that access to justice interventions at a national and international level focus on education as a means of reconnecting citizens to the state. And there's undoubtedly a place for that kind of guidance, but it's often far narrower than policymakers suggest. And a more thorough grasp of people's engagement with courts can help identify where and how um, to design such useful interventions. And in a period of sustained national and international support for access to justice, we would hope really humbly and in a very small way that our findings can help to join a broader conversation and debate over the actually existing dynamics that people have within uh, the citizens court relationship and the prospects for reform. Thanks. That's wonderful. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Sarah Jane, for that presentation.